Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Outsider by Stephen King, a breathtaking novel of suspense. So this was sent to me by Charlie Heathcote as well, so big up Charlie. Obviously I'm a pretty big King fan, and so uh, yeah, I've been excited to get to this. I actually picked it up when I went home over Christmas. I would read you the blurb, but for some reason part of the dust jacket is missing. I don't know whether it was like that when Charlie sent it to me, or whether I just take awful care of books. But on the rear cover it says, now you see him, now you don't. In Stephen King's compelling new crime thriller, indisputable evidence points to a single murder suspect with a watertight alibi. So how can he have been in two places at once? So I guess my main issue with this is that you know that like this guy was in two places at once, basically. And if you've read any King before, you can pretty much guess how that could be, you know? So um, in that respect, it was kind of like watching... Um, I don't know, like watching, it's like, it's like watching a murder investigation when you already know who did it and how, you know? And kind of why as well. But it was still interesting enough to read along. I'm not the biggest fan of King when he writes his crime thrillers, to be honest. Especially because he then puts supernatural elements in, which I feel like kind of, it, it like goes against the purpose of having crime novels, I guess. But I'm going to go through and I'm going to pick out some of my tabs and then I will rate it at the end for you guys. So here we have, um... Arlene Stanhope is giving a police interview. We start off with quite a lot of those towards the beginning, uh, like almost like written as transcripts. And she's going, um, I was coming out with my three bags in my little cart. Three bags is all I can afford now. The prices are so awful, especially meat. I don't know the last time I've had bacon. And it's like, but meat is heavily subsidized by the government as well. It shouldn't be as cheap as it is. Oh, we have a Native American woman called Rainwater as well. And I wonder if she's related to uh, John Rainwater. I think that was his name. Uh, who was the bad guy in uh, Firestarter because he was Native American as well or whether it's just King just you know reusing a, a, a name or whatever so we have a character who just says uh, go ahead lay it on us I love a good story read my way through most of Agatha Christie in high school and you do get a lot of King's little references to Agatha Christie and other detective novelists throughout this as well. So if you've read kind of cosy mysteries, you're going to see little reflections of it here. Yeah, so for an another example here is that um, the murder suspect, his alibi is that he was, um, he was with four English teachers in uh, Cap, Cap City. Uh, and so and Samuels go, uh, Ralph says, what was in Cap City that would take four English teachers there in the middle of summer vacation? Harlan Coven, Terry said. Who's Harlan Coven? Bill Samuels asked. His interest in mystery stories had apparently peaked with Agatha Christie. When I was on Pointless, uh, it's a British quiz TV show, there was a question about crime authors, and Harlan Coben was my answer there. It wasn't a correct answer, unfortunately. We have some uh, references to Edgar Allan Poe as well. And then uh, down here we've got, um, Ralph understood the logic, and in the detective novels Jeannie liked to read, the Agatha Christie's, the Rex Stout's, the Harlan Coven's, it would have been the centrepiece of the final chapter when Miss Marple, Nero Wolfe, or Myron Bolitar revealed all. There was one rock-hard fact as unassailable as gravy. A man could not be in two places at the same time. We have a pop culture reference here. Uh, Alec ended the call and jumped back in his car. He wanted to be home in plenty of time to make popcorn before Game of Thrones. And again, there's another one here. Uh, someone threw a book at her. Ralph couldn't read the title, but he knew that green jacket. Go set a watchman by Harper Lee. His wife had read it for her book club. The cover came loose and one of the flaps fluttered. The book hit her shoulder and bounced off. She didn't seem to notice. And then we have, um, there's an episode of Jeopardy airing and uh, the, the answer on screen was, she demanded Alice's head. That's an easy one, Samuel said. The Red Queen. How is he, Jeannie? So there's a lot of these uh, pop culture references going throughout, you know? We come back to Poe as well. Um, the professor said people had the mistaken idea that Poe wrote fantastic stories about the supernatural, when in fact he wrote realistic stories about abnormal psychology. I thought this was quite quite amusing as well. Um, I would like to believe in God, she said, because I don't want to believe we just end, even though it balances the equation. Since we came from blackness, it seems logical to assume that it's to blackness we return. But I believe in the stars and the infinity of the universe. That's the great out there. Down here, I believe there are more universes in every fistful of sand, because infinity is a two-way street. I believe there's another dozen thoughts in my head lined up behind each one I'm aware of. I believe in my consciousness and my unconsciousness, even though I don't know what those things are. And I believe in A. Conan Doyle, who had Sherlock Holmes say, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. Wasn't he the guy who believed in fairies? Ralph asked. Which is, yes, true, he did believe in fairies towards the end of his life. Could still write, though. And uh, we have another reference back to Poe. Ralph ended the call and sheared off the last stripe of lawn. Then he trundled the lawn boy into the garage. He was thinking of another Poe story as he wiped down the housing, a tale about a man being bricked up in a wine cellar. He hadn't read it, but he'd seen the movie. 
That would be the cask of Amontillado. I read it in French not too long ago. Then we get here a reference to, um, after a brief hunt, he came up with a plastic evidence bag containing the scrap of paper he remembered. It was blue and roughly triangular. At the top, in bold black letters, was Tommy and Tup. Whatever came after Tup was gone. And like, they're like, oh, I don't know what it is. Uh, mean anything to you? Nope. And someone points out correctly, Tup is old-timey British slang for screwing, I think. As in, I Tup my girlfriend last night, mate. But I can't think of anything else. And um, when he uh, when he calls Jeannie and she says, it could be Tommy and Tuppence. They were cutie-poo detectives Agatha Christie wrote about when she wasn't writing about Hercule Poirot or Miss Marple. And so, yeah, it turns out to be a British-themed cafe. But I'm just like, ah, uh, like... You know, I would have thought people would have known that. I don't know. The ones who are... Well, this is just, again, his way of tying it back into crime and stuff. But it's kind of annoying as a reader when you know it, but the, the characters don't, I guess, you know? There's a character who's um, gone through some tragedy and almost starts smoking again. They say, smokers never stop, they only pause. Which I think is true, because I've quit smoking several times and I still crop smoke. We have this little conversation here, because um, there's um, uh, da, 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 a waitress watching, uh, watching an infomercial about golf clubs. As he sat down, Yoon said, I don't know why the waitress is so interested in that particular club. Women don't golf. What kind of male chauvinist world are you living in, amigo? I know women golf, but that particular club is hollow. The idea is if you get caught short on the 14th hole, you can piss in it. There's even a little apron included that you can flip over your junk. Thing like that wouldn't work for a woman. Okay, well, unfortunately, the file got corrupted, so I missed one or two of the tabs that uh, I'd highlighted, but it doesn't matter. We'll just keep cracking on. I've got a few more, and then... Um... Uh, yeah, so uh, as the story continues we kind of focus on the hunt for the outsider I'm not gonna bother explaining all the mythology behind that because I don't know that's kind of Again, I think I said this towards the start that you you know where it's going So that I don't want to explain who the outsider is because that's kind of the mystery of the novel as opposed to who actually did it If that makes sense, so you're kind of watching this investigation take place when you know that there's something supernatural going on but Anyway, so yeah, they're talking about uh, doppelgangers, and they mention Poe again, so they say the most famous fictional one is in a story by Edgar Allan Poe, William Wilson it's called. Uh, but there have been plenty in real life, hundreds it seems like, including one on the Lusitania. There was a passenger named Rachel Withers in first class, and several people saw another woman who looked just like her, right down to the streak of white in her hair during the voyage. Some said the double was travelling in steerage, some said she was part of the staff. Miss Withers and a gentleman friend went looking for her, and supposedly spotted her only seconds before a torpedo from a German U-boat hit on the starboard side. Miss Withers died, but her gentleman friend survived. He called her doppelganger a harbinger of doom. The French writer Guy de Maupassant met his doppelganger one day while walking on a street in Paris. Same height, same hair, same eyes, same moustache, same accent. Well, the French, Alex said shrugging. What do you expect? De Maupassant probably bought him a glass of wine. So for a while there's um, this mystery with these uh, fist tattoos which say uh, can't and won't. And um, so Holly shook his hand last and said, those tattoos on your fingers, are they about drinking? Right, Ralph thought. That's one piece of the puzzle I forgot to take out of the box. Yes, and that's right. Bolton spoke like someone teaching a well-learned and well-loved lesson. The big paradox is what they call it in AA meetings down here. I first heard about it in prison. You must drink, but you can't drink. I feel that way about cigarettes, Holly said. And so now they're chasing uh, the outsider and uh, someone here snaps, uh, someone here goes, what if he has a helper? Tell me that. Count Dracula had that guy Renfield. Dr. Frankenstein had a hunchback guy, Igor. Holly said, that's a popular misconception. In the original Frankenstein movie, the doctor's assistant was actually named Fritz, played by Dwight Fay. Later, Bella Lugosi. I stand corrected how he said, but the question remains, what if the outsider has an accomplice? So yeah, I think that's about all I want to share from this. All in all, I mean, it's okay. I gave this a 3.5 out of 5. This would be pretty good for anyone who wasn't King. But for King, I just feel like he's capable of so much more, you know? It's just, I've just had that feeling with all of these books, really. Apart from Mr. Mercedes, I did really enjoy the first Bill Hodges book. But it just kind of, I guess that was because it felt different. And now it's, it's just starting to feel formulaic for me. Having said that, I mean, it was a fair, fairly well told story, and um, yeah, I mean, it's alright, it's just not King's best, you know? So there we have it, that's what I thought of The Outsider by Stephen King. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.